I'm on my way to a country that I first came to over 30 years ago as a young reporter. I knew very little about it then except that it was rather mysterious uh, in Africa, that it was very beautiful and that it was poor. But I had no idea what I was going to experience, a, a famine of most dreadful proportions. I saw uh, women, children, men starving, dead in their thousands. And uh, the famine itself was a very important event in that country's history. It is Ethiopia. It caused mammoth political, uh, social upheaval. For me personally, ever since, Ethiopia hasn't just been a place that I come to from time to time for professional reasons. Um, it really is very, very close to my heart. And I'm going back there now to explore one really important thing in the whole story of Ethiopia's development, education. There have been schools in Ethiopia for a long time, but this country is going through something of a revolution in education, with massive spending, nearly 20% of GDP. Um, equipment, new schools, new universities. And more than that, there's a, a genuine radical transformation of the curriculum, modernizing it, and teacher training. The government is also committed to reaching the millennium targets for education, which means, in this case, primary education for all. In Ethiopia, that's up to the age of 16. That's a huge challenge in a country that has 70 different languages and is as poor as Ethiopia. Although enrolment has doubled in the last 10 years, the dropout rate is high, boys and especially girls, and usually in their very first year at school. So literacy rates in a country with a population of more than 70 million are therefore still very low, even by African standards. The man who put education at the top of Ethiopia's agenda is the Prime Minister Melis Zenawi, who's been in power now for over 15 years. For quite a long time, he was regarded, certainly in the West, as something of a hero, a new kind of African leader, an intellectual who gave democracy, more freedom to this country. But increasingly, his critics have said that he's really just the old-fashioned kind of leader in Africa. He's locked people up. There's been detentions without trial, including teachers and unions. Um, there have been shootings. After the last election, there was a sort of massacre in the streets, although no one quite knows how it happened. So. I'm now on my way to meet the Prime Minister to find out, is he a democrat or a dictator, visionary or despot? Prime Minister, were you a SWAT at school? Did you work very hard? I did. I did work quite hard. And you were academically good? Not bad, yeah. I uh, didn't get to complete uh, my university studies, uh, but the two years, roughly two years that I spent uh, in the university here uh, were clearly uh, crucial in the formation of my own political views. Can, can you explain that a bit? Well, the university in those days was a hotbed of uh, political activism. Um, I remember. And um, uh, commitment, uh, commitment to change the country for the better. Um, and uh, I picked up uh, a lot of that uh, at uh, university. Your investment in education at the moment is relative to many economies, certainly relative to the United Kingdom, very high. It's 185 18.7%. The economy is growing at the moment 10%. Is it your commitment or your intention to retain that proportion of a growing economy to go into education? Indeed, we've just begun. 
uh, uh, providing uh, access uh, to education to our people. There's a lot that needs to be done and whatever uh, money is generated by the relatively uh, fast growth that uh, we now have uh, gives us the opportunity to do more, not only in terms of uh, broadening the access but improving the quality too. You, you will sustain that level of... Absolutely. Why education the overwhelming priority for you? Because uh, if uh, this country is going to be transformed economically, socially and politically, you need an informed, educated, skilled citizenry. Education is a critical part of doing that. And therefore, we feel that whatever money is available to us uh, should be spent on education first and then with the end everything else later. But if you are a peasant or the child of a peasant in a rural area and you ask yourself, what's in it for our family, for my son, my daughter? What's your answer to that? The answer is that uh, the income of a peasant, an educated peasant, is lower than that of an educated peasant. Uh, if he's educated, he has the means, the uh, exposure, the susceptibility to new ideas, to improve the productivity of his small farm. We know that in theory, we have tested it in practice, and it works. The enrolment in the schools, as a result of what has already happened over the last decade or so, is sharply up. Um, gross enrolment, something over 80% from something only just hovering around 40%. But, and it's a big but, isn't it? Uh, the, uh, the dropout rate is also very high, and especially high amongst girls. Big problem, that. It is. Uh, it's reflective of the uh, quality of education that we're providing. Uh, we've done quite well in terms of uh, broadening the access, uh, not as well uh, in terms of the quality of education. And so the focus uh, of our attention uh, over the past year or two has been to move beyond uh, expanding access towards improving the quality of education that we provide at all levels. That's interesting. It is. You, you, as it were, look at the schools as the source of the dropout problem because some say, actually, it's the pressure from home. The children are needed at home and particularly the girls, the parents still say, you don't need to have an education, your job's here. We need water collected, we need firewood, we need a cooking done, we need cleaning done. Uh, there's a bit of buzz. Um, much of the dropping out is happening in the early years of the educational ladder. And that's where the quality of education is low. Yeah. Had we had more and better teachers taking care of fewer numbers of students, they would have the means to cater to the individual uh, strengths and weaknesses of each child. When you have, as you do, not only a fast growing economy, but also rising inflation for a variety of reasons, which we don't now need to explore, um, that puts big pressure on family incomes. Does that make it more difficult to ensure that the children stay at school? It does, uh, but the impact of inflation uh, in the country varies from place to place. Yeah. In the rural areas, it's not so bad. Of, it's not so bad. Mm -hmm. Much of the growth is being generated by agriculture, and, and people have not uh, faced uh, the type of difficulties that the poor in the urban areas are facing. And therefore, we have to address that to make sure that uh, people are relatively well fed because a hungry child cannot learn. You, you, you talk about the schools and the quality of education. Two possible aspects there, because a lot of school building has been taking place, uh, but you also have um, a lack of equipment still, children without the necessary books, paper, pencils, let alone uh, high-tech materials. Um, and you also have um, a shortage of teachers with the skills. Is that, which is your main focus on that? I mean, I say main focus, it may be both. Well, the key thing is the quality of teachers, the number and quality of teachers. If we have the numbers and the quality of teachers, they can compensate for some shortfalls in the other inputs in the educational system. Do you have to, we know there's quite a dropout rate amongst the better teachers, which is the problem, because they, they think, I suspect they think either um, 
we are still not rated as doing an important job. It's still seen as the job which you do if you can't do something else. And also there can be pay differentials with jobs in the private sector. How do you combat that? Uh, the more uh, expensive uh, the uh, pay for the teachers, the less we can do uh, in terms of building more schools. So we have to strike a balance. But I think there is room for improvement in the pay of teachers even more than has been the case so far. I think we have increased the pay of uh, teachers very significantly over the past decade. Everything, that, nearly everything that I've heard in this um, area about the dedication of the whole process to delivering better education has been positive. Um, now, as you know, there are international organisations working alongside uh, the government in sometimes quite critical uh, roles. And that has involved, like VSO for instance, but I'm not talking to you specifically about VSO, but the process of modernisation of the curriculum and of teaching methods. Is that westernisation? And if so, is it good? Well, modernisation did not mean westernisation. What's the difference? The difference is modernization tries to incorporate the latest findings of science uh, into the day-to-day -day activities of, of, of society. Uh, westernization might mean wholesale importation of uh, both the science and the peripheral issues, uh, cultural uh, issues, uh, into a country which is not Western. Uh, we have nothing against modernization. Uh, there might be some uh, benefits to learning from Western culture here and there but we have to adjust to our own circumstances and I think we have been focusing more on the modernization aspect of it rather than the westernization aspect. And the modernization involves the way in which pupils and teachers Interact. interrelate yes. so that pupils can become more confident and are able to test the teacher as well as the teacher tell the pupil. I mean, I'm putting it crudely, is that it's a sort of participatory process. Yes, and this is very important for us because education here has been more of a uh, rote learning rather than uh, a process of uh, testing and uh, acquiring uh, new information. We want to shift from rote learning to interactive learning between the teacher and the student. And I see nothing that is specifically Western about it. I see this is a proper modern way of teaching students. And are organizations that are involved in that from outside, like, like VSO, do they play a critical role in this? They are uh, playing a very important role in two senses. First, they uh, demonstrate a practical way of doing it for our teachers so that they can see for themselves what its impact uh, could be. And secondly, a good number of them have been involved in the tra teacher training institutes. Uh, and so they, uh, they, they help us teach our teachers both in practice by showing them how it's done and in the institutes, the uh, teacher training institutes where they provide the formal uh, teacher training courses. I want to put this into a slightly broader context. First of all, in terms of the budget and then the social political environment in which uh, teachers teach, pupils learn and outsiders come in to participate in it. Budgets are always under pressure within education but also in other areas. Um, when you look at the great insecurity that there is in the horn generally, look at the situation, the relationship with Eritrea and more particularly now with uh, Somalia, where you or forces are in there supporting uh, the government against insurgencies. Um, your forces have been killed there and they're stuck in Mogadishu. If that continues for a long time, isn't that going to drain the resources, in your terms, leave aside the rights or wrongs, in your terms of national security from the educational goals that you think are so vital? We have been very careful uh, to see to it that our defence expenditure continuously uh, decreases in relative terms as our growth uh, increases. At the moment, it's about 2% of it's GDP. About what? 2% of GDP. From when it was, I can remember, that was up 50, 60% 30 years ago. Yes. And about, uh, what, 15% uh, uh, during uh, the conflict with Eritrea. We have come down from 15% of GDP five, six years ago to about 2% of GDP, albeit in the context of a growing economy. We want to keep our security and defence expenditure in the range of 2% or lower, and we believe we can do that. In the case of Somalia, for example, we sent some troops there, uh, removed the uh, Islamists from Mogadishu, 
and withdrew more than 65% of our troops within a matter of uh, a month or two. Uh, this is very clear indication to us that uh, uh, while we have to take care of our defense and security, in the end, the ultimate source of security is growth, is economic growth, and poverty is the ultimate source of instability. And they won't be sucked in again? You won't no. have to be sending more in? No. That's a big hostage to fortune to say that. You're absolutely certain of that? We are certain. <clears throat> Very interesting. Now come to the, the home front, where all the way since you've been in power, three key issues have been at the top of everyone's agenda, yours domestically, sometimes under great criticism, and internationally as well. They are democracy, freedom, and human rights. You've talked about this before, but are you aware of the... You had elections, 2005. There was a lot of participation before the election. There were debates between government and opposition on television. Then came the shootings and the detentions. I've had people say to me, who are not opposed to you coming to power inside this country, saying, we thought he was a Democrat, now we know he's a despot. What's your response to that? People are entitled to their own opinion, of course, but uh, um, we didn't steal the elections of 2005. Everybody knows that. Um, if people feel that they don't like our policies, they can toss us out. We have hundreds now in Parliament who are from the opposition. And uh, they play a very active role in the day-to-day -day activities of the Parliament itself. For example, when we decided to move in to Mogadishu, 99 parliamentarians opposed our sending troops to Mogadishu and said so. So if that's autocracy, then uh, maybe we have uh, differences of opinion as to what, it, uh, what democracy is all about. I suppose that the degree of anxiety and distrust that it caused means that people today say um, he wasn't really suppressing insurgency by arresting key leading figures in the opposition community. He was crushing alternative ideas, and that's why they say it. Alternative ideas, as uh, uh, exemplified by the positions taken by those uh, who are in detention, are still alive and kicking in Parliament. Still alive and kicking to in Parliament. To the same Parliament. degree, to in, the same in terms degree. of ideas? The same type of ideas, with the same uh, pursued with the same type of vehemence, uh, are being uh, uh, pursued. Can you offer reassurance to the international community, um, and I think particularly of people who might be thinking of coming here uh, to work, because there's been much debate, should we work in a country, I've heard people say it generally, where this happened. I've talked to people who've seen individuals who were shot in the back um, by police officers. Can you give them the reassurance that this was a big mistake in part and that it won't happen again? Well, uh, I think we have to put it in perspective. Not only civilians, but also policemen were killed. Sure. At least six policemen were killed and over a hundred were wounded. So this was not your run-of-the-mill uh, Sunday afternoon demonstration we're talking about. This was an attempted insurrection. When now, you say insurrection, a takeover of, of the power, state in power, Addis and therefore, of course, across the country. That's uh, the claim. That, that it was the intention. It was a publicly stated intention. And that's what we tried to stop. Now, clearly, I regret the number of deaths we had both of civilians and policemen. It could have been done uh, without uh, so much bloodshed. It ought to have been done without so much bloodshed. And I believe all of us have learned our lessons and are capable of managing such disturbances uh, on a much uh, uh, humane scale. Some politicians, notably in my own country, find it very difficult to say, I'm sorry. When you say, I regret this and it should have been done a different way, are you in effect saying, I'm sorry for the things that went wrong? I'm sorry for the days that uh, took place, absolutely. If you're expanding as you are, education at every level, secondary education and university level, those students are themselves going to 
inquire, they're going to have ideas, they're going to explore ideas that will come into conflict conceivably with the beliefs that, that, that you hold. Do you want that to happen? Will you permit it to happen? There is no other alternative uh, for uh, development in Ethiopia except to expand the horizon uh, of uh, the thinking and the ideas of our young people. By providing such a forum, we believe we can manage transformation and transition, not only uh, between generations, but also uh, from a very poor country to some a country that is improving its uh, economic performance. We can do that in a peaceful manner. What is the difference then if, you, if students, and probably their professors as well, some of them, have big demonstrations that are peaceful demonstrations, rallies, campaigning, and they're securing support, at what point does someone step in and say, hang on, we're going to call this insurrection? As soon as they try to change the government and the institutions of government by non-constitutional means. There are uh, instruments within the constitution that would allow them the, to change the government or the boundaries of the country by peaceful legal means. So long as they do it by legal means, it is not insurrection. But there are cases, I'm not saying in this case, where you have constitutions that look wonderful on paper. Some of the communist constitutions and Eastern European constitutions looked wonderful on paper, but they didn't add up to anything when it came to the state actually deploying power to resist those they feared were going to change things. Well, in this case, the constitution is being implemented every day. Uh, there is pluralism in uh, governance, there is pluralism in... Uh, in terms of the type of uh, federal arrangement we have in place. Uh, and so this constitution is not uh, a still uh, a useless piece of paper. What is your vision of how Ethiopia, as a result of the education programme that is in place and that you want to build, what is that country in 20 years' time going to be like in, in your vision of it? In 20 years' time, I think Ethiopia will be a lower middle income country. Uh, lower middle income country? Yeah. That's a huge growth. It is. Uh, if we can sustain the 10% growth rates that we now have, we will be a lower middle income country uh, slightly before 20 years. I think we can do it. I think we have uh, enough of a momentum now to sustain the growth that we have achieved over the past three, four years. I believe Ethiopia then will, uh, uh, we will obviously have had universal primary education in 20 years and uh, hopefully we'll be uh, having near universal uh, access to secondary education and uh, hopefully we will have uh, many more universities than we have uh, not just in terms of numbers but in terms of the quality of uh, education they provide and the quality of research they carry out. There is a goal of course earlier than that which is the Millennium Goal which Ethiopia has signed up to one of which is to, for instance, take literacy 50% uh, higher than it is at the moment. At the moment, it's still very low for reasons we've talked about, and also it's very low in Africa. Do you say, yeah, we are going to reach that millennium goal, or are you going to be like a lot of other leaders who said, well, we may not quite reach it? We will achieve the millennium development goals, and I believe we'll achieve them all. Uh, this might appear to be ambitious, but I'm confident that we'll do so. Um, I'm sure we'll have uh, a universal uh, primary education, not just of six years, but of eight years. Uh, I'm sure we'll uh, have uh, the um, uh, AIDS infection. I'm sure we'll have uh, hunger by then. And once we have the key pillars in place, I'm sure we can address the remaining uh, goals. So you really believe if I come back and talk to you in eight years' time, it's only eight years, that as we tick those boxes, you'll be able to say yes rather than, oh, I'm terribly sorry? Four years ago, I wouldn't have said that, but now I can say that. I said come back and see you. You're going to be still prime minister then? No. You're going to still be prime minister in four years' time? Uh, I don't think so. Do you want to be Prime Minister after the next election due in two years' time? Uh, that is not my intention. I don't like it. You would like to leave before the next election. Is there anyone who can take over? I think this is my last term, and I'm sure there are, uh, if you're talking about 
my own party, I'm sure there are many who would take over. With democratic maturity, um, prime ministers um, either go because they've voluntarily decided to leave or their party said, we've had enough of you, on the one hand, or on the other hand, because they've been chucked out by the voters. Which would you prefer? I prefer to leave without being asked to leave. Of your own volition? Yes. So that someone else would lead your party into the next election? Uh, I prefer to make sure that this is my last term. Well, I may have to talk to you afterwards. Sure. Thanks very much, Prime Minister. Thank you. That's terrific. Yeah. Thanks very much indeed. With Ethiopia, you have to take the long view. And if you do that, I believe you're bound to conclude that this country is heading in the right direction. It is more open, more free, and more prosperous. And specifically in education, the challenge is, of course, enormous. But I would not want to bet against the Prime Minister's very confident assertion that this country will meet its millennium goals. In fact, I wouldn't want to bet either against his vision of how Ethiopia is going to be in 20 years' time. And I very much hope he's right.